Jamie Metzl's work has him examining the future and the tools we will have at our disposal. With these tools of the genetic revolution, we are going to be able to fundamentally transform our biology. And His wide-ranging work has him looking into ways our technology can be used to further our health care. We invited him over to our offices to discuss how technology plays a part in our response to public health emergencies. Your futurist, you talk about technology and, and the advancements. Uh, how does that factor into this, and will it speed up a vaccination in a sense, do you think? Yes. Um, first, sequencing the genome of this virus happened really quickly, something that would have been unthinkable 10 or, or 18 years ago, and that's great. Um, there already has been a lot of work on a vaccine for SARS, and the COVID-19 is, is, is related in some ways on a genetic level um, to SARS. So using the tools of these diagnostics and gene editing, we're going to move much more quickly toward a vaccine. But even with that, that incredible speed relative to where we've been, it may take up to a year uh, to, to develop that kind of vaccine. The tools that we have are far beyond anything we've had in, in the past, but this is really a big challenge we're facing. I'm really concerned about the Wuhan coronavirus, also now called COVID-19, um, because we don't know enough about the transmission. It's, the rate of transmission is extremely high, and we're finding that the virus itself is more infectious than people previously thought. When I uh, read the reports of the doctors and nurses in the hospital in Wuhan, uh, getting the virus, even though they were in a hospital that had been set up to protect them, it made me realize that we are dealing with something that is probably more infectious than SARS. Jamie's concerns about the spread of the COVID-19 virus are not unfounded. A level two hazmat protocol is in place in Wuhan, meaning all medical and volunteer staff must wear two layers of protective garments, including full facial protection. Despite these precautions, hundreds of healthcare workers have contracted the virus. China has a relatively strong public health infrastructure. But if this virus winds up in slums of Bombay or Lagos, Nigeria, or places like that, it could spread really, really, really quickly. So these are critical moments now where the whole world needs to come together. China is definitely the epicenter, and the world needs to be actively supporting China, but this is a global effort. In March 2003, the world awoke to the SARS outbreak. Just like COVID-19, SARS is a respiratory virus that causes potentially fatal pneumonia. SARS is also believed to have originated in China, but the virus transmission rates caused international alarm. Through global cooperation, travel restrictions, and controls, the SARS outbreak was able to be contained in the summer of that same year. Since you are a guy who looks to the future, uh, design the future of COVID-19, how long are we looking at? You know, I wish I had that knowledge, and I don't know. I mean, if, if there is some miracle happens and it's contained, and we're able to do rapidly deploy diagnostics, and that anybody who's, who they were testing people who've been exposed, maybe there's an ability to contain it. If it breaks out into these big global megacities, and these megacities are relatively new phenomenon, um, then it could really go a, a long time. And, and so you don't want to have a situation like the, the Spanish flu 100 years ago that you know, 50 million people died. I don't think that's going to happen now. Um, but this is really an unknown. And that's why every, nobody can blame any other countries. Uh, we need to come together as a global community because this is a global threat and we have to address it that way. You brought up something very interesting, though, uh, in the sense that right now, 
influenza here in the United States is, is killing a lot of people yes. uh, compared to what we're seeing with COVID-19. And yet people are terrified of COVID-19. It's all anybody's yeah. talking about. They're not talking about influenza. How do you square that? So certainly influenza, the flu, is a big challenge and lots of people die and that's terrible. But flu is relatively standard and it's relatively straightforward. If we had the Spanish flu and 50 million people were dying, we would be freaking out. And this um, COVID-19, the Wuhan coronavirus, it's new, it's much more infectious and much more deadly than the in deadly in terms of the people who are exposed, the percentage of people who die, than the, the regular flu. And so um, in the United States right now, lots of people are dying from the flu and one person has died from the COVID-19. How quickly should we be moving, in a sense, listening to what you're saying, thinking about these things? Because I don't think people are thinking about it at all. Yeah, I mean, that's my big mission in life. Um, we need to get ahead of this curve. This future is coming at us much faster than most people appreciate. And if we wait until there's a crisis, it's going to be very, very difficult to have an inclusive, thoughtful conversation. So. That's this paradox. Now is the time when we need to be laying the foundation, but people around the world are focusing on other things. Maybe the coronavirus crisis, if we can really understand what's happening, maybe that can spur people to recognize that we need to be having a conversation about genetic technologies because that will be part of our response to coronavirus. It already is. I mean, the virus was sequenced very rapidly, something that would have been unimaginable 18 years ago when, when SARS happened. Um, the speed toward developing a vaccine is much, much faster as a result of these, uh, of these new tools. And I think people are starting to get that something really big and really deep and really fundamental is happening, and I hope that we can use these kinds of crises in many ways as an opportunity to bring more people into the conversation about what we need to do, but we don't have unlimited time. Jamie, thanks so much. My great pleasure, Mike.